Rich Lund, just a guy trying to help out the Monarchs, and I hope your season is going well. In the most recent episode, we went through in detail a new study out of the University of Chicago that showed pretty effectively wild-reared monarchs, in order for them to become part of the migration, truly need to be reared outdoors, so that way they receive the most environmental cues possible. If you aren't familiar with the details that we discussed, I very much recommend going back and checking out that episode first, so that way we're on the same page as we go through this episode. From the study, though, as a bit of a refresher, when wild eggs, wild-sourced monarchs, were reared indoors in simulated autumn conditions, they were not able to show migratory behavior as a group. Whereas wild eggs, wild-reared monarchs that were reared outdoors in pop-up tents were still able to show migratory behavior as a group. First, let's talk about when do you start doing this. The migration of North American monarchs is usually in full swing in October. And if so, that would mean that adults that are emerging, eclosing out of their chrysalis near the end of August, those would be some of the first ones that are likely going to participate in the migration. Depending upon their temperatures during development, both in the caterpillar stages and in the chrysalis stage, going from egg to emerged adult can be anywhere, according to my data, from 21 to 35 days. Usually, though, it's somewhere between 25 and 30 days. That would mean any eggs that are laid and found starting in August, we should assume, are going to be part of a migration. If you want to be even safer, you could say, all right, I'm going to start then rearing outdoors any monarch eggs that I find starting the last week of July. And that's where I'm going to draw the line for my own personal rearing. Next question that we probably really want an answer to is, well, what is outdoors enough? It's an excellent question. But it's also a question that I don't know anybody really has the answer to currently at this time. More research has to be done. Here's what we know. We know that monarchs that were reared in a mesh pop-up tent outdoors did receive enough environmental cues. They showed as a group migratory behavior. So let's say that they are here. We also know from the study that monarchs that were reared in an indoor setting where the temperature was kept at a constant 18 degrees Celsius, 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and receiving 14 hours of simulated sunlight each day, that those monarchs did not show migratory behavior. Let's say that that group is, I don't know, somewhere over here. Somewhere here. I don't know where to point. Those two situations are what we know about. One worked, one didn't. Now with those two being like flag posts where we know something, a lot of questions about the gray area in between exist. Like, is it possible that when it came to the indoor reared monarchs where they didn't show migratory behavior, is it possible that maybe there was just one environmental cue that was missing? That if they had just done like one extra thing to simulate outdoor conditions, those monarchs would have had migratory behavior. Was that almost outdoors enough? It's possible. But at the same time, somebody could argue from the other end, well, maybe it's that the monarchs that were reared outdoors, maybe they just crossed the finish line with outdoors enough. And maybe if just a little bit had been different and a little bit less of those outdoor conditions present, maybe they wouldn't have been migratory at all. That's also a possibility. The honest and truth is, we don't know. We don't know anything about this gray area. Somewhere in between these two conditions, probably outdoors enough might exist. But further complexity to this is that it's probably not a yes or no, all or nothing situation. There probably isn't a finish line to cross where, yep, finally it's outdoors enough and they're all going to migrate. See, even the ones that were reared indoors, as a group, they didn't have migratory behavior, but a few individuals did. And when it came to the ones that were reared outdoors, as a group, they showed strong migratory behavior. But not every individual did. So it's probably more like a spectrum, where the more outdoors conditions you give them, the more likely they are for that individual to become part of the migration. And then also, further complicating this, so far with this line here, I've been treating this like it's a linear spectrum. It very well might not be. The bottom line, though, is we don't really know. So the best option that we have is to try to take late season monarchs that we're rearing and rear them with as much outdoor exposure, as much environmental cues as possible. And that's the same advice as the authors of the study. I bring this up now because I know that some might wish to describe their setup that they use in the comment section below and ask, is this good enough? I know that we'd love to have a yes or no answer to that, somebody's seal of approval, but I'm just letting you know now, I don't have that answer for you. I don't know that anybody does. So with all that in mind, I've attempted to recreate an outdoor setup as best I can, similar to what produced migratory results in the experiment. Now I don't doubt in what I'm about to show you, there's probably other ways to do it that can equally be as effective. You can modify as you see fit. I am not an expert. I am not an authority. I'm not telling you what to do. Instead, I'm just showing you here's what I'll be doing 
to Rear Monarchs Outdoors for any eggs that I find starting in the last week of July and onward for the rest of the season each year. All right, let's get into it. We can't have any areas where water is able to pool up and risk the drowning of caterpillars. So the container itself needs to be able to have water drain from it and also any containers we put inside of our setup has to be able to drain water. And next, obviously, we gotta have a setup that can handle your typical wind speeds. Something that's not gonna blow over. After those two concerns though, a third concern would be keeping the undesirables out. No matter where you are at watching this video, I can safely say that ants are there too. And of course you have your typical wasps and hornets which would love to make a snack out of a caterpillar. Hymenoptera and Lepidoptera don't really get along. And then of course there's the boogeyman of the monarch world, the technid flies. So these three ideas were kept in mind in developing and engineering what this setup would look like. But let's start with the egg first. When it comes to hatching the eggs, I will still be doing that the same way that I have. These small to-go food containers work pretty well as an egg nursery. If I don't cut out the egg from the leaf that I've taken it from, that leaf will be shriveled up before the egg ever hatches. That causes problems. But also those little cutout squares that I usually have, those things would be very much subject to the wind blowing around. Once we have that first instar caterpillar though out of the egg, outdoor rearing begins. I had not used these mesh pop-up tents before, but in trying to think through what the different possibilities are, this seemed like the best option. Now, some might ask, what's wrong with just keeping, you know, a, a plastic terrarium outdoors? Isn't that enough? And potentially, maybe it could be enough to where they could receive environmental cues. However, there's definitely areas where water would pool up if it rained. And in addition to that, I did some temperature measurements. And if this is kept in direct sunlight, the temperature compared to outside was anywhere between 5 all the way up to 9 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. It just did not seem like a good idea. Not the safest idea for them. With the mesh pop-up tents though, we have something that is very much breathable, and this is also a very similar kind of tent to what was actually used in the experiment to rear theirs outdoors. The one that I purchased here, this was 10 bucks, and it has a nice zipper opening, so we can easily get in there and out, most of them do. And it had the size of mesh that I preferred. This is pretty small. Now, when it comes to those tachnid flies, I don't know if you understood this or not, but tachnid flies, they're really part of an entire family, tachnididae. And there's over 10,000 different tachnid flies in that family. Some of these can be about the size of a normal house fly, but some of them are quite small as well. But when it came to this mesh fabric, this was small enough to where I don't think any tachnid flies are going to be able to squeeze in through there easily. Now also, part of this one that I have, We've got a smooth plastic surface here, and I had to make a decision as to, does that go on the ground or does that go up? Well, if it was down on the ground, I kind of like that idea as far as easy cleanup of the frass, but the thing is, that just allows for there to be a place where water can pool up. It seemed to make more sense to me to have this be the top of my outdoor enclosure. This way, it's a bit of protection from the rain. Less water would actually get in there on a rainy day. But in thinking ahead then for cleanup, down at the bottom, on this mesh surface, we're gonna have plenty of frass eventually. And so what can we do to minimize that amount of frass? And assuming it becomes moist in there, moist frass is gonna easily get in between that netting and it's gonna maybe even stain it too. I'm okay with some stains, but I want it to be something that's a little bit easier to clean up. Here, let's go down a little bit lower and show you what I mean. All right, so for the bottom to work properly as allowing water to drain through it, our outdoor container is gonna to have to be elevated. So I'll be placing three bricks or so about the length of our outdoor container. I could just do it with two, but I'm gonna use three and you'll see why here in a little bit. So just being that much elevated will allow water to drain should rain water get in there. Next up, to help with the frass cleanup, we're gonna assume that rain is gonna get in there and that things are gonna get moist. So to help with cleanup, I'm just gonna line it with some paper towel. Now, some frass could still get onto that mesh, but it's just gonna be less likely with the paper towel there. It's just gonna make cleanup a little bit easier. Now, I'm gonna add a couple of bricks just on top of the bricks that this is resting on. And now the reason why I'm doing three is gonna be a little bit obvious when you see my containers. I was able to pick up these containers at a uh, dollar store, and for the price of, you guessed it, one dollar. 
I don't exactly know if these are for like office supplies, something to put on a desk, or if this is for like straining food, washing and rinsing your strawberries you picked. I don't know, but it serves my purposes because it has holes on the sides, which means that wind will be able to pass through it, and it's got holes at the bottom, so that way water cannot collect should rainwater get in there. This was pretty ideal. And it's also a good idea to have plenty of backups for this just to make cleaning easier. You'll see in a minute. So I'm going to place these just here on top of our bricks. And thus, here's why I have three bricks in the first place. Now once our baskets are in place, these two are also going to have to be weighed down. And for that, we can just use some shallow yet heavy enough rocks to place in there. Okay, now, with our setup weighted down, assuming normal wind speeds, this should do just fine. Air can pass through it, there's plenty of ventilation. Uh, last couple of days I did also test this out to see what the temperatures would be like inside compared to what's outside. While I didn't record that video, I guess you'll just have to take my word on it, but when it came to the temperature that was inside compared to the ambient temperature outside, it was always about 0.5 to 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit difference. A little bit warmer in here, just a slight bit but nothing that's significantly different than what the outdoor temperature was. Okay, so once you've got then your basket secured, they're not gonna be blowing around anywhere. It's time to bring in the stars of the show. These leaves with the caterpillars on there can go just nicely into the basket. These have fifth instar caterpillars on them. They've actually been raised in this outdoor, well, in a different outdoor container, another pop tent that I had. Uh, they've been raised since first instar outside. And so another reason why it's a good idea then to have some of these extra baskets is it makes cleanup so much easier. Once some frass is collected and it's time to clean, you can easily just remove this basket, quickly transfer the leaves and caterpillars and rocks into a fresh basket, put it back in there, and then you've got the uh, basket that needs to be cleaned free, and you can just go ahead and go inside, clean it, and get it ready for next time. Now it is also worth talking about, you know, the younger instar caterpillars. Is this still a good setup for them? And when they're smaller, they certainly can find other places to hide, a little bit more creative. First and second instar caterpillars can be quite small. And something to think about in the setup, and I had to think about this while I was developing this too, every place where there's surface area, that's just another place for these younger caterpillars to hide. And it's a valid question too, I mean, depending upon your mesh hole sizes, couldn't a first instar caterpillar be able to escape from this? Technically, yeah, that could be possible. Again, the smaller mesh size is better, but it would really have to be on a mission to try to escape in order to do so. What I like about this setup is that with the baskets and with the bricks and with the paper towel, there's just so much surface area that it would really have to be on a mission to escape. When I had these guys in here as younger first and second instar caterpillars, what they were often doing is staying with those leaves. The younger instar caterpillars just tend to have an instinct to stay on the leaf. There was one wanderer and I found him just on the bottom of the basket. Now, I would hope it would go without saying, but I'm just going to say it so it's been said. Count is very important with this. I would hope that in any rearing process you've been doing anyway, you've always been keeping count of how many caterpillars you have in a rearing container. When it comes to the small guys that could easily hide in any of the surface area, the baskets, the rocks, uh, down on the paper towel, you definitely want to have a firm idea of how many caterpillars are in there. All right, we're just going to edit this in the middle of our episode, but as a slight deviation, this is the next day, and we just had a downpour of rain. So let's see how we're doing on the inside. And, yeah, I'd say that's successful. No pools of water. Our baskets are quite dry. I'd say that this passes the rain test. All right, back to your previously scheduled episode. Okay now, but still, a valid concern. What about when it's time to make the chrysalis? And while I haven't encountered this, what about this uh, smooth plastic surface? Are they really gonna appreciate that? Are they gonna J-hang from it? From images I've seen online, pictures people have posted using a very similar or maybe even the same brand of pop-up tent, when they have had this be the top, I have seen uh, chrysalides hanging from it. So I know that some caterpillars will J-hang from this. But I've also seen plenty of images of some caterpillars making a J-hang on the side of the mesh. So let's talk about what we can do about that. So if a caterpillar 
happens to try to J-hang from the side, that can cause an issue. Whenever a caterpillar attempts to form the chrysalis where it's in contact with something vertical, that can cause the chrysalis to possibly be misshapen. And if a chrysalis is misshapen, well, that can lead to wing deformity or other deformities. It's risky. So in using such a pop-up tent, I mean, you can't really prevent them from ever doing it, but if we've got this smooth plastic top, while some will J-hang from it, it maybe is just better to give them a nice option. Using some type of tool or mesh fabric, I had some of this stuff uh, left over from a Halloween costume, you can safety pin it to the sides and then you have a place that gives them a very good option if they're crawling up looking for a place to hang from, uh, they will hang from this. Now, as the University of Chicago study was able to show us, they had nine monarchs that were being reared outdoors as part of that autumn outdoor group, and they ended up taking in nine of those chrysalides. They did it because some severe weather was on the horizon, but after four days, all of them had come out of the chrysalis, and so they had been reared outdoors the entire time and in a chrysalis outdoor the entire time, but when brought inside for just three or four days, that was enough for those nine to not show as a group migratory behavior. So we know that the chrysalis needs to be reared outdoors as well. Certainly you could have a chrysalis hanging in the same container as your fourth and fifth instar caterpillars, but the issue there is that sometimes caterpillars have been known to nibble on a chrysalis. So in other words, where does the chrysalis go once formed? What are some options? First option, somebody who's raising monarchs could say, all right, after I've raised it to the chrysalis period, after it's in the chrysalis stage, I'm done. I'm going to hang it outside, and I'm going to let nature take its course from there on out. I don't know how many people are going to be jumping at that, but, you know, maybe if you're busy, it's still awesome that you brought it from egg all the way to chrysalis. You've done it some help, for sure. However, let's be honest, there are still risks, then, to it hanging outdoors, the same risks that it would face in nature. And, of course, another drawback is that if you're hanging them outside, if you're not right there when it closes, well, that monarch's wings are going to dry, and it'll probably take off without you ever getting to see it. Another option. Do you have an outdoor yet somehow screened-in enclosure? Is an outdoor screened-in porch, like what I'm sitting in now, is this outdoors enough? Again, the honest answer is, I don't know. But I think it'd be a difficult argument for someone to make that a screened-in porch area somehow has less environmental cues than a pop-up tent does. It's essentially like a just larger pop-up mesh tent. In the screened-in porch area, humidity is the same, temperature is the same, and definitely you get the same amount of sunlight. While maybe less direct sunlight, still chrysalides in nature are in the shade quite often. But for those who don't have a screened-in area like this, that might be why you want another pop-up tent specifically for the chrysalides and for emerging adults. It gives a place for the chrysalides to hang without any disruption from other caterpillars that might be crawling around. It allows for the adults to have a nice, comfortable place to eclose and let their wings dry. And then, once dried and ready to go, the adults are there for you to be able to still OE test them, if that's something you do in your process, and then give them a good send-off. And of course, since we're talking about doing all this during the migratory season anyway, this will also give you a chance to tag them if that's something that you also do. Alright, I really hope you found this information helpful. I'm predicting, though, since this is a new part for pretty much all of us, there's going to be plenty of questions that come along the way, and also some of you might have some really good insights, innovations, and ideas as far as how to modify this to suit your needs. I urge you to share both questions and ideas in the comments section below. Let's learn together and from each other as we do this. I know plenty of you are going to have some valuable things to contribute, or soon will. And if you do have an interesting idea for your setup and how you tweaked this procedure, well, providing us a link to a video that you've uploaded onto your YouTube channel can really help us see what you're talking about. I'm Rich Lund. Thanks for watching. Thank you for doing what you can to help out the monarch butterflies. And don't forget, raising the monarchs means nothing if we aren't also planting milkweed. Good luck with your outdoor enclosures. Good luck with your migratory season. And I'll see you next time.